Would you stand with me this morning for just a moment? Father, I've grown up all my life going to church. Many people here have as well. There are others that this may be their first experience, and there are others that have said, I don't want to go to church because it's boring and want nothing to do with God, and yet we are about to enter into a sacred moment where we believe that you, through the gift of preaching and the anointing of your Holy Spirit, begin to capture hearts, begin to change lives. There's some people that need deliverance today. There are people that have been praying for a long time today that need encouraged. And so as your servant today, I ask that you would add the element of your presence and your anointing to your word so that it will have an eternal effect. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. For those of you that are taking notes, the title of this message is Whoever Controls the Altar Controls the Outcome. <clears throat> Whoever Controls the Altar Controls the Outcome. I started last Sunday, by the way, I, I recognize that nine inches of snow made it hard for some of you to come to church. and, and uh, the first service last week, we had 40 people here and 160 people that joined us online. So there were four times as many people that were saying, you know what, I think I'm just going to watch online today. It's, it's so nice to see all of you back. <laughs> Happy New Year. I say that because the message that I had last week, I believe, was a prophetic message as it relates to what God wants to accomplish to us. And if you didn't hear it, and if you didn't see it, then would you please go to our website, Grace agsyracuse.com, click on the media icon, and would you please listen or watch that message because the title of it was, Lord, Do It Again. Lord, Do It Again. And there were some very important principles that I outlined within that that were kind of a launching pad to the series that we are in. Uh, I believe that God has prophetic, prophetically challenged me that He wants to do things again, but we as individuals and we as a corporate church, part of a worldwide church, will determine how engaged He will become by the level of engagement we are in prayer. One of the main resources, as it has been for me as I've been preparing this series, is, is Rick DeBose, who is the assistant superintendent for the General Counsel of the Assemblies of God, and I want to make sure that I acknowledge much of his work because I'm going to be referring to it a lot throughout this series, but he certainly needs to be recognized for his work. And I need you to know something. The battle for the altar is real. The battle for the altar is real. The devil is going to do everything he can do to keep you from praying because he knows that the moment that you engage in prayer... There is a supernatural work that begins to dismantle some of the things that He wants to accomplish. And so if He can keep you from praying, then He can keep you from fighting. Your prayer fights against His plan. So He wants to keep you from an altar of prayer. So when we look at this, and, and I recognize again, I've said I, I grew up in the church, and, and those of us that have, many of you are like me, we have a Christian ease. We, we have terms that we use, and, and I recognize we've had so many new people be, becoming Christians and followers of Christ and new people that are following and, and coming to church. And, and what you need to know is when I use the term altar, um, I, I recognize that in the front of the church last week, I called us all to the altar. It's a place of response. Uh, but the altar is not limited to, to a church auditorium or a church sanctuary. sanctuary. Altars are any place that you find to pray. And so we, we recognize that, that when we are called to an altar, or when we are called to a place of prayer, the enemy works overtime to make sure that you can't make it. How many of you are like me? That the moment that you get down on your knees and begin to pray, every email that you didn't return suddenly comes to your mind. The moment that you set aside a time when you say, I am going to focus in on speaking to the Lord, suddenly the to-do list that you had forgotten. It's amazing how memories return. 
when we want to pray and things that we have forgotten to slide away suddenly come back in. Or you get an emergency call or something urgent begins to take place. And, and the reason for that is because the enemy knows that if he can battle your mind in prayer to keep you from the altar, then he controls the outcome. The moment you pray, he begins to lose. It's one of the reasons that we're given the gift of the Holy Spirit to help us fight that battle. So for those of you that say, I have a horrible time trying to keep my mind focused when I pray, the first thing I'm going to ask you to do in that is when you're developing your prayer life, simply say, Holy Spirit, would you come alongside of me? Would you help me? And the Holy Spirit says, I'm an expert in prayer. I will begin to quicken your mind. I'll begin to quicken you in direction that you are to pray. I'm going to come alongside of you and help you to begin to develop that. And suddenly you'll begin to discover your prayer life can be cranked up with the help of the Holy Spirit and as we learn to pray those. I will admit to you that I'm glad today that I am a pastor of this church and not just a guest speaker because I told my staff that I was going to spend the first month focusing on prayer, but as I've gotten into this, I don't have to get it in in a month. We're going to spend some time because I am so convinced that what happens in your prayer life is going to determine the, the intensity of the revival that God is waiting to pour out. So when I talk about an altar today, I'm talking about a place of prayer. So for some of you, your altar is going to be behind your steering wheel. It might be the only place that you get to be alone. You get into your car, you close the door, and however the distance is that you get to drive behind that steering wheel, you have an altar with God. Let me just remind you, it's okay not to close your eyes if your altar is behind the steering wheel. I would, I would highly encourage that, that, that you don't have to close your eyes to pray. For you, your altar may be your kitchen table. It, it, it may be a place in your house. For Cindy and I, we have a, a sunroom with a couple of chairs that when we gather there, that, that becomes our altar. For others of you, there, there's different places that you pray. I, I, I remember well working with my father-in-law when I was his associate pastor, and for him, his altar was grabbing his dog by the name of Bear and walking a block from his house to the railroad tracks, and he would walk for miles next to those tracks knowing there's nobody around out there that can hear him as he touches the throne of God. That became his altar. And so this morning, I want to talk to you about the altars in your life and the altar of prayer and the importance. And if you have your Bible, I'm going to ask that you would turn to Acts chapter 1. The first part of this message, we're going to talk a little bit out of Acts, and then the end, well, we'll wrap up in Daniel. But in Acts 1.14, the Scripture says, they all joined together constantly or consistently in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with His brothers. These are people that are being described in Scripture as those who have been followers of Jesus. And, and we know that the group was much larger than this. These were just a part of the group. In fact, the Scripture tells us that there was 120 of them. And after Jesus had descended, He begins to send back the signals to the Holy Spirit of the power and the importance of prayer in everything that would take place. In fact, for those of you that read the book of Acts, you'll recognize that everything started with prayer. Prayer was the main focus. It should still be the main focus of the church today. It's when we pray, things begin to happen. It is not something that we add on to our life. It's not something that we just try to find room for. It is the main event of our life. And if you move from Acts chapter 1, verse 14, into Acts chapter 2, when things begin to happen, it tells us in verse 1 of Acts 2, when the day of Pentecost came... They were all together in one place. And what were they doing in that one place? They were praying all together in prayer in that one place. And then the Scripture says this, And suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, filled the whole house where they were sitting. I was thinking about this last night when gusts of wind of 50 and 60 miles an hour started hitting our house. I had just kind of finished preparing this, and I'm going, I wonder... If this is what it sounded like to them, after an extended period of time in prayer, if the if this place began to shake and you wondered if it was going to hold together because of the power of the wind. But I want you to look for a moment at this word suddenly. Because if you're writing down notes, the first point today is I want you to prepare for suddenly. Prepare for suddenly. Sometimes sudden is not so sudden. In fact, if you capture the context of this Scripture, 
they had actually been praying for 10 days. And because they had been spending time consolidated consistently in prayer, when the right moment came, when the day of Pentecost came, they were doing the right thing when the opportunity was available and then suddenly arrives. Suddenly. We see this term in Scripture on a regular basis. In fact, isn't that the way we pray? I'm coming to the altar today and today, Lord, I would like you to suddenly heal me. Lord, today I would like you to suddenly provide for me. Today I would like you to suddenly give me direction that I've, that I've been hoping for. And, and we d- begin to develop this image in our mind that this is how God works, that one prayer and boom, God begins to answer. But I need you to notice that suddenlies are often preceded by times of prayer. Suddenlies are opportunities that begin to arrive. Suddenlies happen when we're doing the right thing at the right time and when our prayers align with God's purposes. When God's purpose comes and we're not aligned and we're not in prayer and we're not a participant, then we lose the opportunities for the suddenlies that he wanted because we didn't prepare ourselves in prayer. I begin to think about that in terms of my own life. How many opportunities... Did God have in my life that he wanted to do something suddenly, but because I did not participate with him in preceding that time in prayer, that I was not in a place or in a spiritual position where I could seize the opportunity for a suddenly because I was unprepared. You see, altars are places where heaven and its power and resources meet earth in its needs and weaknesses. I'd like you to write that down. Altars are a place where heaven and its power and resources meet earth in its needs and weaknesses. It is that place, in that place of prayer, that altar of prayer, where we tap into the heavenly resources. Jesus tells us, Don't you know that the kingdom of heaven is at hand? In other words, don't you know that the resources you need are within reach of you? Don't you know that everything that you desire in the Spirit is within reach? You just need to reach over and take it. Everything you need is there. It's just on the supernatural side. And something that we think about is, Lord, when we're praying for miracles, we're asking that the supernatural would break the screen of the natural and become present to us. And Jesus says, don't you know, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Prayer becomes the transition point between the supernatural and the natural. For those of you who are Bible scholars and Bible studiers, you will recognize that prayer is often the point when what is available in the supernatural transitions through the natural, and it's through the portal of prayer. It's when people have prayed that suddenly things begin to happen. Somebody, when there's a miracle that takes place, somebody built an altar. Somebody prayed a prayer of faith. There's a process of prayer, and prayer caused the impossible to become possible, and the supernatural to become natural through the portal of somebody's prayer because they built an altar and they prayed it. We see this all the time in salvation. And I am so grateful that in this church, rarely is there a service that goes by that somebody doesn't respond to the salvation call to become a follower of Jesus Christ. But when we receive Jesus as Savior, when we discover that I am lost and I am a sinner, how do I transition from being a sinner to being saved? How do I transition from being lost and dead in my sin to alive in Jesus Christ? How do I go from being lost to found? We know that Jesus did his part on the cross. And he rose from the dead. He was resurrected from the dead. And he sent the Holy Spirit to do his work to draw us. In other words, while I am preaching today... The Holy Spirit is at work in your life trying to take out points of what I'm saying and apply them to your life. Here's how that looks sometimes. I've had more people than I can tell you about come to me at the end of a service and say, did my friend talk to you about my life before church? Did somebody come and tell you what's going on? Because you preached exactly what's going on in my life. Can I tell you? They didn't tell me. But the Holy Spirit knows. 
and takes the word of God and begins to draw you, draw you to himself, begins to apply it in a way that it's applicable to you. For those of you that think church is boring, you don't know the Holy Spirit because he will bring life to you in this. And knowing that the Holy Spirit is drawing people from that moment of, of response, it tells us in Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. You will be saved. When you confess with your mouth, you know what that is? That's prayer. When you confess with your mouth, when we pray, God, I am a sinner, and God, because I'm a sinner, I am right now bound by the consequences of my sin, but I need to be delivered, and I need you to know that I believe that you're the Son of God, and I believe that you died for me, and I believe that you paid the penalty so that I don't have to suffer eternally for what I have done. I believe that you've changed me, and you begin to pray that with your mouth. The consequences of sin are broken. You receive the Lord, and you submit your life to him. And if you have prayed that prayer, the portal of the supernatural opened and suddenly became alive in you. It is a supernatural experience that takes place at the moment of salvation. Does that make sense to you so far? Even Jesus, at a point of a miracle in time when he's about ready to feed 5,000 people, and he takes the bread and the fish, and what does he do with it? He lifts it before the Father and he prayed. Before the miracle came the altar. So whatever it is that you need within your life, whatever miracle that you have been praying for, the kingdom of God is at hand. And the portal from the supernatural to the natural is through the altar of your prayer. Sometimes it takes sustained prayer for what we want to see. Sometimes prayer has to be kept up for a while. Sometimes the first prayer doesn't seem to be getting through. If you have your Bibles, turn to Mark chapter 9, verse 28. And, and before I get to that verse, let me just set for you the context of what is taking place here. There's an incredible little story that takes place because prior to what happens within these verses, three disciples were with Jesus on the top of a mountain. And as he's on the top of the mountain, Jesus is transfigured before them. In other words, what that means is he took, off, he took off the garb of humanity and he put on the glory and the garb of heaven before their eyes for just a moment. I don't know what you picture when you, when you picture what heaven is going to be like. Whatever it is, no matter how good your imagination is, it's not good enough. But there was this moment of time for these three disciples with Jesus when Jesus takes off the garb of the earth, puts on the garb of heaven, and he is transfigured, he's blinding, he's so white. And the clothing that he wears, and then Moses and Elijah shows up, and they have this discussion, and these three got to see for just a moment the glory of heaven itself. And then they begin to realize just how close the supernatural is to the natural, just how thin the barrier is between that which is eternal and that which is natural. And then after that, Jesus takes off the garb of heaven, puts back on the garb of humanity, and walks with them down the mountain and tells them, don't tell anybody what you saw. Can you imagine trying to hang on to that secret? And as they are walking down the mountain, these three people and Jesus, having just been in this marvelous setting, they come down the mountain, and as they do, they run into the other nine disciples who have been praying for a boy that a devil would be cast out of him, and they are unable to do it. It's a stunner to them because this has never happened to them before. And the father of the boy sees Jesus and comes running to him and says, your disciples have been unable to do anything about this. Can you? And of course, Jesus commands the demon to leave. The boy is set free. The devil, the devil shakes him violently. He's set free and he left them. That evening, when they all gathered together, it tells us in Mark 9, 28 and 29, after Jesus had gone indoors... His disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out? And he replied, this kind can only come out by prayer. There may be another version of your Bible that says prayer and fasting. I spent a little time breaking this verse down 
from Greek because I wanted to understand it a little bit better. And Jesus says three things about this particular incident that I think are important to us. Number one, he says, this kind. They had already been given authority in the name of Jesus over demons. In fact, everywhere they went, they were praying for people, and people were being delivered, and people were being healed. Why didn't the name of Jesus alone work here? And the Scripture says, this kind. The Greek word for that is genos which means this class or this level or this level of authority. In other words, just like in heaven there are spiritual authorities, in hell there are demonic authorities of different levels. And so this was an anomaly to them, and he tells them this kind. There are going to be spiritual forces that we face that a little prayer life is not going to be enough. And then he goes on to say, Not only is there a specific kind, but he says it only comes out. You have to deal with this devil only this way. And then he uses the word, it only comes out by prayer. Now, we see that word prayer and we think of it in terms of just a a regular prayer life. Let me tell you what the meaning of this is in the original. It means this kind comes out only through a place of prayer or a consistent prayer, or this kind comes out only through a person who is consistent in a place of prayer, who builds an altar of consistency. Now, what this begins to say to us is this, do you know that your prayers accumulate an authority? Your prayer life The more you build an altar and the more you pray, the more power is dispensed to you that over time it begins to weigh down and that even the heaviest devil on the other side can be weighed down and overcome through a consistent prayer life that builds into you the authority that even this kind flees when you pray if you have that kind of a prayer life. It's different than just praying for a need. We, Like I said, we come to the altar and we anoint you with oil. And that is effective and that is biblical. But oftentimes when we do that, we are praying, hoping for a suddenly that comes without a prayer life. And the Lord is saying, suddenlies happen when you have a prayer life. And you begin to recognize those things. It's prayer alone. Short little prayers. A prayer life that just says, in the name of Jesus, I command. These things will not come out without a consistent prayer life. So here's what you need to know. Sometimes your prayer is not an ending to the process. Sometimes your prayer is a beginning to the process. And Jesus was saying, you have to establish a prayer life. You have to get into a place of prayer that is so dynamic and so consistent and so faithful, and you just keep on praying that when you face the devil himself, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world because of the consistency of your prayer life. So Jesus was teaching them, this deliverance comes in the conclusion or the ongoing prayer life of the individual, a person with a prior powerful prayer life steps up and it looks like a suddenly when it has been hours in prayer coming and the demon is suddenly gone and the boy is suddenly delivered and healing suddenly covers and it looks so easy but what you don't know is that that suddenly came at the end of extended prayer. So prayer accumulates in power. Prayer is not just for public consumption and just to be seen. Prayer, the altar of prayer, is to be a lifestyle for all of us because only a lifestyle of prayer handles that kind of demon. Now, I think that America is facing that kind of demon. I think it's a level of demonic power that we've never dealt with before that is going to require the church corporately to enter into new levels of prayer than we've ever been in before. We just sang a song about sending revival. And we sing it with joy and enthusiasm, and it's what we want. There is a price to revival. There's a price to spiritual awakening. And in this fast food society, when I pull up to a window and I make an order and I get what I want, we need to recognize that there are still some things in prayer that only come through prayer and fasting and a consistent prayer life built up over time again and again and again. Then we will be ready. I don't want to offend anybody here, but 
it's always fascinated me how many people love to fly to where revival is happening. Somehow believing that they are incapable of having that kind of revival where they're at. You know what? You're just flying into something somebody else prayed for and prayed it in. We qualify for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit that is different than anything we've ever experienced in our life. I loved listening to my mom and my my dad and and my grandma and grandpa talk about the revivals that took place there. I don't want my children and grandchildren to have to listen to our stories. I want them to experience it because we prayed it in ourselves in an altar of sacrifice where we brought the power of God from the supernatural into the natural because it was important to us. So how can we learn more about prayer? I'm going to ask that you would turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 6, verses 6 through 9. There's a passage there that says, Now the administrators and the satraps went as a group to the king and said, O king Darius, live forever. The royal administrators, the prefects, the satraps, the advisors, the governors, and have all agreed. I just, did you see that list? That sounds like the whole government, doesn't it? They have all agreed that the king should issue an edict and enforce the decree that anybody who prays to any god or man during the next 30 days except to you, O king, shall be thrown into the lion's den. Now, O king, issue the decree and put it in writing so that it cannot be altered in accordance with the laws of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be repealed. So King Darius put his decree in writing. How does this all happen? It all happens because there was a bunch of people that were jealous of a man of God who recognized that because of God's anointing upon Daniel's life, he was in a position of power and influence and and he had a level of intelligence and discernment and character and loyalty that they didn't have. And they could not move him out of that position, which kept them from being able to move up into positions and roles that they wanted. And so they begin to discuss it among themselves. How can we get rid of this man so that we can have better positions? And as the discussion went along, they said, we can't, we can't charge him with cheating because he never does anything wrong. He's so honest. He doesn't embezzle. We can't bribe him. He doesn't run around with women on the side. I mean, he's like holy. I mean, we, he's like, there's no flaws in him. And, and one of them must have said, and listen... This isn't in the Bible, but this would be in my version, the first, the first book of Dominians. <laughs> that somewhere along the line in there, somebody must have suggested this. You know, if there was a law against prayer, we'd have him. Because the guy can't help himself from praying. In fact, he prays all the time. And another person must have said, hey, hey, that's a great idea. Let's find a way to make it against the law to pray. And somebody else steps up and says, you know, we know the king, and he, he's an arrogant old man, and uh, he thinks pretty highly of himself. So if we cloak this in the context of, oh, king, we want to honor you, you great, wonderful man, that for the next month, for the next 30 days, nobody prays to any god or any man except to you because you are so honorable, oh, king. And make him sign it and seal it with his ring. Because once it's sealed, it is unchangeable. And they created this whole plan together. Knowing that if this comes to pass, Daniel is going to mess up. He can't help himself but pray. And yet there is something more here than just the desire of men. Since we who are believers understand that there is a spiritual realm just out of our view... That when we pray, there is a warfare that goes on just out of our view. What is really happening is that men who are in leadership positions were listening to the voices of the demons, saying, this is what we want to accomplish through you. And so we're suggesting to you, make it against the law to pray. Because when Daniel prays, he messes up my kingdom, Satan said. Why would the devil be so concerned about one man's prayer life? Because the devil knows whoever controls the altar controls the outcome. Whoever controls the altar controls the outcome. And if he can stop Daniel from praying, then everything that God wants to do through Daniel stops with that. And we know now looking back that there was a whole plan of God that he wanted to accomplish. That after 70 years, the nation of Israel, who were now in Babylon, was supposed to be restored back to the land of promise. 
The land of promise was important because that's where Jesus would be crucified and that's where Jesus would rise from the dead and, and where the Holy Spirit would be outpoured on the day of Pentecost. It's also the place where Jesus will return one day and there's going to be a new Jerusalem and a new authority and God's kingdom will reign there for a thousand years. And the devil knew as long as there was a man that was praying and declaring the promises of God in daily prayer, he would lose his ability to manipulate the world. And so he needed to get Daniel out of the way. And the only way to do it was to make prayer against the law. Why do you think, folks, that it's against the law for our kids to pray in school? Why do you think, as I stated last week, that our culture is doing everything it can do to take Jesus and make him private? Take him out of the public square. Take him out of the public view. It's okay for you to go to church. Don't talk about it outside. If you want to pray, just stay in your own home. Don't talk about it in public. None of this is new because whoever controls the altar controls the outcome. Church, this should convict us. Satan knows that if he can keep you too busy or too sleepy or too stinking lazy or too distracted or too interested in your own passions and interests when it comes time to pray, then he can keep you from the altar and he controls your destiny because he who controls your altar controls your outcome. And it's not for lack of what God wants to accomplish. It has everything to do with your own personal discipline. Because once you understand the power of your altar and you make it a priority and you fight for it the way that Daniel fought for it, then the devil is a loser. He cannot win. You have reached into the heavenlies on the other side of the supernatural and drugged the provision into the natural, and Satan is defeated if the church will control the altar. Does this make sense to you? Is it applicable to you? I want us to grasp the power of our own altars. The New Testament church that continued to keep prayer as the priority, continued to move the devil out of places that he had had for years and put the kingdom of God in places that he had not been in for years. And so back to Daniel. They'd made it against the law to pray. Daniel was scared. By the way, sarcasm is one of my languages. Daniel was so scared of this law that he went home and he opened his windows, the Scripture says. Does this tell you something about an anxious person, be anxious for nothing. Lord, they've changed the laws. There may be laws on earth, but there's laws in heaven that supersede the laws on earth. Daniel was so attuned with what was going on, and he understood where his power and authority came from, that he opened his windows while he prayed. Now, some of you have a prayer closet. This would have been a really nice time for him to just slip into the closet, close the door. He could pray there. Nobody outside the windows would hear him. He could have kept his windows closed, but he didn't. In fact, I believe that he opened his windows on purpose so that those who were seeking to take him down could hear him calling out their names in prayer. Daniel said, if they're going to cause this to be against the law, then I'm going to give them all the ammo necessary to convict me of praying to God. If they're sneaking around outside my house, I'm, going to, I'm not going to hide in my closet and I'm not going to live in fear, but I'm going to take a hold of the power of the altar and I'm going to pray in such a way that I'll leave the results and the outcome in the hands of God, but I'm not giving up my altar. And so Daniel's enemies had a pretty easy time of finding evidence to take back to the king. And the moment that the king heard that somebody had broke the law, he said, who is it? And the moment they mentioned Daniel's name, he knew he had been trapped because he needed Daniel. And he began to grieve in his spirit. And the scripture says that they took him to the lion's pit, den, but it's really a pit. In fact, they take a stone off and they drop you in and it could have been pretty deep. And they don't worry about you getting hurt when you fall to the bottom of the pit because you're not coming out anyway. And they drop him into the pit, and the king yells out in this moment, May your God, whom you continually serve, rescue you. That was a scripture that is spoken out of guilt right there. 
And the leaders rolled the stone back on, and then it's, it's unique in the fact that all of the leaders that had rings of authority placed the wax there, and every one of them, including the king, had to imprint this. So, so they wanted to be so sure that Daniel couldn't get out, that nobody would come to rescue him. And the king couldn't sleep that night. He knew that he had been tricked. And before the sun comes up, the scripture tells us in Daniel chapter 6, that when the king came near the den, I mean, he didn't even get to it. He gets near it, and he begins to yell out. And he's yelling out Daniel's name in an anguished voice. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually. Do you hear the continual prayer life, the altar that is kept up during all of this? That you talk to all the time. Has he been able to rescue you from the lions? And Daniel, with the gracious man that he is, says, O king, live forever. He's supposed to be dead. And even in the middle of all of the trials and, and the hardships, he still has a dignity to him in this. O oh, king, live forever, even though on the inside he's going, you are a foolish, arrogant man. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They've not hurt me. Because I've been found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done anything wrong before you, O king. And the king was overjoyed. And he gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when he was lifted from the den, there was no wound that was found on him because he had trusted his God. Now, back to the book of Dementians. I believe that Daniel, when he was in that den, put his feet up on one lion used another one for a pillow and scratched its stinking ears. Can you picture it? That which we fear so much in prayer, God subdues. Some of you are dealing with fearful things in your life. And a spirit of fear has captured your heart. It is the accumulated prayers of the altar that builds in a confidence that that which you fear you will overcome to the power of our God. It's also interesting that those that tried to trick the king, it wasn't just the men. The Bible says their wives and their children. Boy, there's a lot that could be said about the influence of a father on his home in here. Their wives and their children were dropped in, and suddenly the lions got hungry. Suddenly it's happened after prayer. And they were all destroyed. Later on in Daniel, I need to just share this, and then I'm going to wrap up. Later on in Daniel, he has an encounter with the archangel Gabriel, and they have a conversation. And Gabriel says, let me give you some insight. And this is important for us as a church to understand. He says, Daniel, I want you to know that from the moment you begin to pray, we heard the first word. Heaven hears you when you pray. Some of you need to know this. Heaven hears every word you pray. Every word. And Gabriel said, we were dispatched by God to come and be an answer to your prayer the moment that you begin to pray. However, this kind, this spiritual authority was so great in the fight against you because they knew, Daniel, if we could stop you from praying and if we could stop an answer from coming to you, we'd destroy the whole process of which God wants to, to do His work in, in generations to come. So intense was the battle, Daniel, that it took 21 days in prayer. Not only that, I was not making progress as an archangel in my army, so I called another one by the name of Michael, and his army came to two archangels and their armies it took to overcome the, this geno of demonic, satanic power. What would have happened if Daniel quit praying at day 19? Because what the scripture is implying here is that Daniel controlled the armies of heaven on his knees. The more you prayed, we heard, we responded. And the more you prayed, it was like, is he still praying? Yep, then send more angels. 
Day 14, is Daniel still praying? Yep, then send more angels. Day 19, is he still praying? Yep, we control the heavenly forces while we're on our knees. And on day 21, the kingdom of heaven overcame the kingdom of the enemy. And they answered the prayer of Daniel. Folks, this easy believism and this easy idea that we just pray and God does something instantly needs to be dispelled. There is work to be done. There's discipline that needs to be developed. I I heard on the news this week that the 14th of January is called National Quit Day because it only took 14 days of people making resolutions to realize they couldn't do it and they quit. And that just struck me. Lord, don't let your church quit. Don't let us quit. Because whoever controls the altar controls the outcome.